Now, where the hell is Iñaki then? Eh? Hello, this is back here. Well, the thing, the thing of starting here is that it doesn't matter how do you understand the city. The thing is that the city is a very complex system of systems. And as such, you have to expect the unexpected in that regard. Always, every single minute, because you never know where you can apply the smart city technologies. And that is a very important element to understand. Yeah? So after this be of a show, <laughs> yeah? but it's important for me to, to wake you up in that regard. Yeah? So why are we going to talk about this? Why are we going to talk about two different cities? Because there are two very different cases that are very applicable to very many places. First of all, we've got Barcelona. And Barcelona is a metropolitan area. Yeah? And as such, it's very similar to Munich in that sense. So it's very similar to the Randstad. Yeah? It's very similar to these kind of big cities where you've got a mixture between character, technology, business development, territorial management, and so on. And on the other hand, we've got Beasain. And Beasain is a very small, very rich town in the Basque Country. So <clears throat> if this wants to work, yeah. The thing is that um, cities, and we have, in, in order to go further on, even advanced technologically, we have to understand the history a bit. Yeah? You, you can never be an innovator, be the label you want, if you don't understand what's behind, what happened some centuries ago. That means that cities are always a resource management tool. They are always resource management systems. Cities were created in order to manage resources in order to better and more efficiently manage sun, rain, earth, and wind, which as systems, they get crops, money, minerals, utilities, and so on. So cities were then created as management tools. And the most important part of a city is space. Yeah? And space usually is this kind of height, width measurement, right? But what happens if we think of it as a resource rather than a multiplying thing? Yeah? Cities now have a problem with space as a resource. They don't have a problem of how to manage utilities, how to manage all these kind of things. Space has become a problem because man resource management is key for them. Yeah? Everything that, because at the very end of the day, a city lives because taxes. Yeah? And taxes, usually the main income of taxes is due to space management. Hmm? <clears throat> so where does come smart then? Yeah? Um, if you see previous literature, uh, you try to think about different aspects of the city, you will understand that most of the people will tell you that cities have always been smart. Yeah, because it is a series of systems that are applied to other systems and so on, cities have always been these kind of smart bodies. Yeah? But the main difference now is that technology allows us to have a kind of independent city, yeah? a layer of self-deciding city rather than having a human interaction per se. Yeah? And when happened that, when data became an utility rather than a privilege, if you want to ask anything, just ask, yeah, raise your hand or whatever. But differences in cities have happened when utilities have changed. No? This is a very brief explanation of wha what has happened for the city whenever an utility has showed up. No? So at the very beginning, you've got the hyper-dense city, you know, this kind of very, very dense city where the neighbors were just two meters apart. But then, sewage appeared, which was the first utility per se. That allowed the city to expand. That allowed the city to change. And if the city changes, people change. And if the people change, actually the activity within the city changes as well. Another one, which is very interesting, is when data and communication networks started to show up. That allowed remote connectivity. Yeah, first television networks and so on, that started to <coughs> actually 
change how the city was working again. One of the biggest changes as well for the city was more or less here. Do, 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 do. Uh, uh, uh. When the elevator appeared as well. The elevator helped the city grow in height. Yeah, I know that sounds fairly obvious because now we own it, yeah? But the elevator allowed the space to be used more densely, yeah? To intensify the use of space. And now, we are having the data revolution. Again, the change from a privilege to a utility is on when that utility or that factor becomes something widespread. Yeah? Data is now having the same revolution as electricity had at that time. Yeah? Electricity at the very beginning was a very large privilege, whereas nowadays we take it for granted. It's one of the basic needs or services that city has to actually give to the citizens. Yeah? Data is exactly at the point of that change. Yeah? Data is exactly at the point where it's no longer a privilege, it's widespread. <coughs> and the first, thing that, the, the first thing that data is changing, I don't know if you know this picture by any chance. Yeah? That can be a generic city. Yeah? Well, it's actually LA. But could you know which is actually the most expensive real estate there? No, um, I mean on here, on this picture, which is the most expensive building? Uh -huh. Okay, no is that one. <laughs> okay, that generic one. Why is that? The first revolution data is actually having us is changing the real estate um, market. That is a hotel switch. Oh, switch hotel, sorry. Yeah, you know, everybody knows what a switch hotel is? It's actually a large building with nobody inside where different companies just plug their data connection. Yeah. And it is a geographically placed uh, real estate value. It depends as well on the ping number. Yeah? The smaller the ping number is, the financial institutions will pay more because the ping number is much smaller. Yeah? So all the algorithms actually have a much higher rate of yield of results. Hmm? So you will find that this kind of, all of a sudden, really high spike real estate areas are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah? And they don't belong. Data is actually changing that vision of the city of something which looks expensive has to be expensive. No. Something which is very close to actual value is getting expensive. Yeah? Rather than the usual change that we have. Yeah? That is the first change. And this is actually the interior of it. Yeah? Where you can see lots of people walking up and down and having interaction. Hmm? Meaning nobody. But this actually... <clears throat> Sorry? So the thing is that this, for a city which can be something good, is actually very bad. No? Because again, city, a city is a tool. A city has to be managed. And the ones using the city are actually citizens. Hmm? And cities, yeah, sounds obvious, but we tend to forget that. Hmm? Because that building yeah, has roads around. Those roads have to be maintained. Those roads have to be kept, swept. You need to water the trees. You need to blah, 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 blah. If nobody's using them, it's a wasted resource. Yeah? Because you don't need them to have. Hmm? Now, just to have you a bit uh, of a background on both. Yeah? Barcelona, I mean, you've got the data there and so on. And you've got the Beasain as well there, just as a matter of fact. Beasain is a very small town, but it's a very rich town, yeah? and it's very well connected. The hmm? thing is that one of the European largest uh, train manufacturers is there. It's actually 
all of this. And now they are suffering a bit, a close up of it. Yeah. Now they are suffering a bit the problem of the riches, yeah. which means that there is a lot of economic activity which doesn't actually resort on the city. Yeah. This is actually the rush hour at the very, at the, I'm not joking. I mean, this is five o'clock in the afternoon, which is when children stop school and so on. Yeah. Um, and this is not a specifically bad weather day there, so. Hmm? I mean, the weather is rather great <coughs> there. Anyway, but the thing is that, and we'll go a bit later as well, as well on this. What Smart City Concept wants to do is, because you will see that um, the Smart City Concept goes to um, smart governance, smart citizen, uh, smart appliances, IoT, and so on. The thing is that if those systems do not work well, you still have this kind of landscape. Yeah? Because this is a fairly intelligent town anyway. There are tons of sensors there. Yeah? And still doesn't work. Why is that? Because they haven't taken into account actually the citizen. Yeah? They are separate branches, they are separate verticals of not understanding the citizen. Yeah? And actually not understanding the geography. The geography is very important there. Um, this is a real slope, that meaning that it's not exaggerated. So this is actually let me go, the height difference that is there. Why is that? Because that affects the city experience. And what a smart city, in order to apply a smart city concept within a city on a town, you need to start designing a city experience. And that is very difficult because your user base goes from zero to 120 and goes years, obviously, and goes from two nationalities to, say, the number. Hmm? <clears throat> so why are we managing that? Um, a smart city, and this has to please get branded on your brains as data scientists or programmers, People tend to lie a lot. Yeah? People will tell you that they are healthy, they sport every day, they watch cultural channels, they go to museums every day, and so on. Yeah? The reality says the other one, the other way around. Everybody watches soap opera and yeah, never sports, only like the 2nd of January, yeah? the goodwill day. But the key to a smart city deployment is actually how, as um, data scientists, you can build a analog and a digital model. Yeah? Meaning that you have to go, no matter what, to ask to the citizen. That is the analog part, and that is the difficult part. That is the difficulty of building an analog model and to compare that to the digital model that you get. Because it's fairly easy to track people via the um, phone location. Yeah, you can know easily, and it's open source data. You can actually easily know, which has, you cannot, I mean, it's obviously anonymous data, but you can know where is the density, which is the real activity of each place. Yeah? But that is, that's what you have to contrast in order to create a citizen experience with what they want. And for that, what we have developed is a perception chain. How many of you are aware of the value chain? Raise your hands. Everybody knows what a value chain is? Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> a value chain is an inbound system. It's an inbound logic. Yeah? It's the value that an organization can put within the market with the capabilities they have. Yeah? So you've got, you start from point A on the process and you go to the end of it, right? The perception chain goes the other way around. It starts from the very end and goes to the very beginning. The perception chain is used, and this is roughly the main axis, because each one of those is actually divided in around another five categories, yeah, in order to create that um, citizen experience. What it allows us is to actually create this kind of model. Yeah? So you see the value chain goes there, but the perception chain goes backwards, 
what that allows you is actually see which are the services and which is the perception the citizens have from the city, which is key. Because else you are going to over-resource something which is not perceived. And that is a problem for the cities, again. Yeah? It's about resource efficiency in that regard. And both data design, which is the most useful data for them. Yeah? Because perhaps you can get um, objective, like uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide data for them, yeah? which is not useful. That was one of the things that we actually got from building up the perception chain. CO2 is not perceived. Hmm? Although it's a silent killer, it's not perceived. Hmm? Although dust levels are perceived, humidity levels are perceived. Yeah? So in order to design a smart city and all the stuff that goes down, meaning sensor design, meaning IoT, meaning Wi-Fi deployment, meaning Bluetooth deployment, and so on, has to actually take into account that CO2 is no longer useful. That it's dust which is useful. Hmm? So once we apply that, that change it into that. Yeah? The reorganization of that is that. So actually, those are the main perceived points of the city. <clears throat> See that safety data, which is the amount of reports you have from police on an area, is, has very little impact on the citizen. Although it has a high impact on the police, it has a very low impact on the citizen. Hmm? Because actually, in Barcelona, for instance, and in Beasain, what the citizens perceive as the most dangerous places are actually the ones which give the least reports. Yeah? So again, it's a matter of perception rather than a matter of objective data. Hmm? <coughs> Same happens with urban service data. Yeah? Citizens do not see which is the expenditure that the city has there, the amount of money that goes for uh, sweeping the streets and so on. What they actually see if there is an illegally occupied space, yeah. highly perceived data, rather than objective data about numbers. Hmm? <clears throat> so, actually, the first thing that you have to do in order to, or we are doing, sorry, <laughs> on Beasign, in order to apply, is change the city experience model. And we will link Barcelona and Beasain in this way. Meaning that Beasain is, a, like Munich, is, very, is a very fragmented city. Yeah. Although streets are everywhere, the city experience is dots. Yeah. You are here on the West End, and then you take the car, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, until you reach your destination. Yeah. That is called the tunnel effect. Hmm? <clears throat> so, our task is actually to intensify the use of those dots. We need to connect them in a non-linear fashion. Yeah? I know that sounds a bit abstract, but the thing is that you need to imagine your usual uh, family unit. Yeah? Mother, father, two kids, and a dog, more or less. Yeah? Because cats are not that good to have a stroll. What we are actually working with the city of Beasain is how we can expand those activity circles for the whole family unit in order to them to touch. Yeah? So that they are actually going from there to there, and from there to there, and from there to there, and from there to there. Because although the, um, the town is very small, they've got a lot of traffic issues. How does this actually benefit the city? Because at the very end, your client is going to be the city hall. Hmm? And at the very end of the day, you have to make your client's client happy, citizens. Hmm? The goal is to reduce 15%, which is a huge amount, 
the number of car usage within the town. Yeah? And this is a fairly small town, per se. But still, because the city experience that people from the assigned half is that of point to point, they overuse the car. And that affects, again, all the rest of urban services. Yeah. So from, I want you to get from the assigned that fig, the thing that even though a town is very small, yeah, in order to have a successful smart city model, you have to design the experience that they are going to get. Because all the technology you are going to use, all the sensor and blah, 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 all the verticals are going to actually trickle down to how that city is used. Hmm? And the link is that this is the assign. Yeah? On Barcelona, on the other hand, the citizen experience is very different. I don't know how many of you have been in Barcelona, but <coughs> Barcelona is always a linear experience city. You don't have a dot of experience. You don't have an event happening there. You've got the whole street. And that is the way that even inhabitants in Barcelona leave the city. People in Barcelona are not going to tell, I live in this square. They are going to tell you that they live in the crossroad between two streets. So the mental mapping is about streets. The events are always linear. It's not just a dot. So compared, and those are, this is scaled, I mean, it's on the, on the same scale. The experience is completely different. And that affects, again, every single service and every single measure that you have. And that affects, is affecting the data sheets that we are having and the data sets we are having. So <coughs> once we had that, we realized that Barcelona Although, because this is the very heart of Barcelona, I mean, this is the uber touristic area of Barcelona, where everything should be filled up with um, yeah, you need tourists up and down. No? The streets you see highlighted have zero traffic. Zero traffic of cars and zero traffic of people. And this is a huge waste for the city hall. Yeah? I'm going to go ahead a bit. So for you, to, for you to understand, this is Barcelona on July at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, on the very city center. No? I mean, La Ramblas, if you know, it's five minutes away. The problem Barcelona has is what it's called the shutter syndrome. The shutter syndrome is whenever all the um, shops and uh, street level businesses are closed. So the experience actually that people get is just to have a tunnel. We are never going to stop there. Hmm? In order to reactivate that, the smart city proposition that we are having is actually uh, how to connect real estate so you have lateral movement, lateral traffic between both sides of the streets. How can we do that? The first thing is that data, have, as we have seen, allows us to change the physical model of a office. You don't have to be on the same building to work together. Even if you are a service company, you don't have to be on the very same building in order to actually share resources. What that allows us is to actually, sorry, break every single function that you have and force people there to go from one side to the other. Hmm? Well, secondly, what it allows us, because what you see here is a time management um, floor plan, more or less, diagram. What it allows us is to have a dynamic real estate. It means that you can fairly easily and fastly, actually, monitor which is the real estate which is being used or empty. Yeah. It's not the same to have something empty or have something unused. Hmm? And data allows you, actually tax data allows you, to monitor which is the empty space that you have. Yeah. And that allows you to actually pinpoint which are the empty spaces within the city. So it allows us to create 
what we call a distributed business incubator, which is what we are planning to do there. No? Yeah. Sorry, Again. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. <coughs> what you see on the diagram, yeah? Actually, the dotted elements, those elements, is a street. Yeah? The colored elements are actually the side buildings. Clearer now? Mm. Okay. <laughs> what it allows us is, and this is the advantage of using data to create new uses for existing places and for existing cities, is to have a dynamic real estate management, which means that for the city, they don't have to build extremely large buildings, they can start recovering with the same faction existing buildings and existing streets and hence existing quarters. Because the business incubator can dynamically grow according to the requirements. The things that you see in other color are the expected private support services for the business incubator, yeah, such as bars, coffee shops, and so on. Yeah. Because the goal is not, for, is not for the city to have the ownership of the street is just to activate the street. Yeah? The goal is actually in 10 years for the red squares to disappear. Hmm? What that means is actually that you have to get from there to there. Yeah? Why does this kind of new citizen experience design help the city? First of all, because you start creating and forcing that kind of transversal circulation, which is key to activate the city. Secondly, because, and we have just closed that, we can start using very low resolution presence cameras to measure the stopping power, no? which is added to the data set of the city. Then you know which is the average speed of the street. That is very helpful for the city hall in order to manage not only the utilities, but in order to control the real estate value as well. Because a lower, usually lower speed real estate has higher value. Secondly, for the um, human habitat element, is that we are designing carbon trapping um, floors and dust trapping floors. The technology is fairly simple. It's the same UV technology that you use on windows on that. Yeah, you know this kind of UV technology? It's a compound which is laid over the stone, which reacts with UV, and actually makes, uh, disintegrates dirt or dust into a much, much smaller particle, which can be then easily washed away is the one used on skylights, actually. And this kind of very difficult to reach skylights on houses and so on. Yeah, they've got this kind of coating for them not to be cleaned. But then another good thing about this is that we are actually trying to activate the city 24 seven, yeah, which is why the citizen, again, the citizen experience is very important. Why do we have chosen a business incubator is there because the economic data sets from the city is telling us that business incubators are going to be a 10 year lasting element within the city. You cannot create economic activity out of the blue. That is not really the point. And then, just to see a bit, this is an existing one, this should be the end result. The advantage of this, the advantage of data, is actually that you can use granular, a granular approach in order to improve the city. You can actually surgically change the city rather than having to build from zero an evergreen place. Hmm? Another thing that if you are the data scientist have to understand is that the timing of a city is immensely slow. What that means is that usually, and that, that, that makes a city very complex to understand, is that usually the 
generational, as, as you say, a business has an incubation process or period of three years, more or less, yeah? A seed innovation has an incubation timing of 18 years, which is usually the amount of time for a family unit to grow from zero to university when it gets not disintegrated, but disentangled. Yeah. That makes, um, because this kind of legacy is going one on top of the other, that makes the city a very complex system, per se. Hence, and going back, from everything that you have seen, ta -ta -ta -ta, ta -ta -ta, this is actually what you have to have in mind. Yeah? That you need to actually create a perception chain for any kind of data or technology that is going to go within the city. Be that automatic lighting, be that self-cleaning elements, be that interaction systems. Because if it's not perceived, or if it's not part of the larger perception part, then it's going to get lost. And that is the major difficulty that the smart city concept is facing now in order to be applied. The kind of resource allot allotment of big data, data crunching and so on, in order to get a value, because that value has to go to the citizens. And remember that, for instance, elderly people are not very keen on smartphones, right? However, they are actually the people who have most to gain in healthcare system, in loneliness management, because that is a big issue as well for elderly people. Loneliness management in Barcelona is a big issue because it creates, at the very end of the day, and sadly, it creates a high expenditure for the city, the loneliness management, because most of the emergency calls are not done because there is actually an emergency, a physical emergency. There is a loneliness emergency. Hmm? And that was a bit what I wanted to talk about, about the, how to apply um, a smart city in that sense. Just to sum it up, is that if you want to actually, if you want to actually um, apply the smart city concept, you have to think on how to improve the existing city rather than an evergreen new development. Yeah? That a smart city concept has to tackle citizens, not processes, but citizens. Hence the difficulty of it, because again, people lie. And people will tell you that, yes, they do like this very much, but they are not going to use it. Hence, you need to cross the digital data and the analog data and create your own city experience model. Yeah. That was it. Any questions so far? Okay, glad you asked. <clears throat> the measurement we had here, for instance, on this very street, were environmental measurements such as CO2, NOx, and um, I don't know the name in English, uh, arsenicus. Yeah, because arsenic is used in a lot of uh, solvents. Yeah, I know it's a poison, but it's still used in lots of solvents. Yeah. Paintings, wallpapers, certain types of uh, fabrics and so on, they all have arsenics in supposedly very small amount, but added up, they are a very important pollution factor on a city, hmm? especially on old parts of the city. Yeah. Those were the, object the objective values. On the subjective values, yeah, we asked them, which is the <clears throat> amount of open dustbins they see, hmm? which is the amount of, um, sorry, but shit pieces that they see on, on the street. Yeah? Not only pieces, but paper and uh, wasted cans and so on. Yeah? And how many times do they actually clean themselves the street? 
And this is just because that comes from talking to the sociologist who is working with us, yeah? Which are actually the measurements that you have to put, as you said, on a concrete level in order to measure other things. Yeah? For instance, the feces element measures only, no, not only how de dirty that uh, street is, but as well how many times they perceive or they are aware of how dirty that city or that street is. Yeah, so from one data set, you are able to actually extract two different kinds of data. Yeah. On a practical level, on a traffic management level, we measured which was the average speed of transition within the, or oh, sorry, circulation within the, um, within the street. Broken down on hours, meaning that two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, and so on. In this case, it was done manually, but you can do it as well fairly easily uh, with cameras and presence sensors or pressure sensors. So, yeah. What that was given us was the tunnel effect activity and intensity on one hand and how that street was communicating with the other streets. Because a street is not a single element within the city. Yeah. It's not an isolated event. Yeah. That street happens to be there because there are other streets adjacent to that, both parallel and perpendicular. Yeah. Hence, that measure not only gives you the intensity of use of that, as well as how it is communicated with the other streets, which is the relationship. And because we were able to measure the speed of the other streets, you can measure as well the change of speed. Yeah? Meaning that if a car was going at 20 kilometers per hour on the upper level street, yeah, the one perpendicular, it could change to 40 kilometers per hour here. Hmm? And that gives you change, and that gives you stopping power as well of the street hmm? on traffic level. On the real estate level, <coughs> it was easier somehow because the only two data that you have to have is, is that space you being used and is that space being taxed? Hmm? Because if a space is being used but it's not being taxed, it's an illegal space. Ah, okay. Okay. I was, I was thinking that you were asking for the data in the regard. Yeah. The first thing is, has been actually to negotiate with the untaxed spaces a relatively long-term hiring contract of five years yeah? in order for them to gain a win-win situation. The owner gets the space up to scratch, up to legal and technical uh, requirements of health, sanitation, electricity, safety, and so on. Yeah. And the city hall gets a much lower rent. Hmm? That was the most difficult part to do, actually, to convince the owners. Hmm? The second task was to identify which were the economic clusters affecting them. Yeah? Meaning that you go back there, blah, blah, blah. You cannot have the same subject of a business incubator here as here because they will eat up. Yeah, they will cancel each other. That is really not the point. Yeah? So the second thing was to see which was the main economic activity which could be benefit from economic clustering. Yeah? For instance, this one. Yeah, is fairly close to the food market, yeah, the, old, the oldest food market in Barcelona. Yeah? And it's actually surrounded by people who are working on the food industry, not only for tapas bars and so on, yeah, but for food development. Hmm? The main theme for that incubator is going to be food. Yeah? From food data to food development to food technology. Hmm? The ones here are very close to a jazz conservatory. Hmm? 
they already have a up and coming music scene. The subject of this, the clustering is music. So they do not cancel each other. That was the second step then. Put a label on what you do. Because again then, clustering allows citizens to perceive an activity on a place of the city. And that is actually helpful. If everything is mingled about, it's very difficult to um, recognize that a place belongs to, or an activity belongs to a place. Hmm? Recognition was the second step. Because you've got the city hall backing for the business incubator. It is a sponsored business incubator. Because several banks have already agreed to put learning and coaching resources to it. And thirdly, because, and most importantly, because your future clients are one step away. So that is as important as that. Yeah? So the perceived value of the economy circle is as well implemented in there. Another problem of the smart city, even technologies, is the business model. But not the business model of how to make money out of it, is how to add value out of it. That money eventually will come, and it actually comes. But if you don't add value, you can get money fairly fast. But it's not adapted to the city development um, timing, so to speak. So you need a minimum of six years of development in order to a street be activated. No. No. You can see Delft example from 1980 to 1985. They put a freeze on traffic, meaning that there were no street lights, there were no you don't. What you need to control is the speed gradient. No, 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 no. Actually, it's very funny. Traffic has the nasty ability to regulate itself. True. But immensely. I mean, actually, the more you regulate the traffic, the worse it works. You I haven't seen this kind of funny and risky Indian uh, videos of a crossroad, Indian crossroad, where it really looks like being chaotic and nobody gets harmed, surprisingly. <laughs> but that, that experiment was done in Delft, actually, from, for five years, from 80 to 85. And it actually worked. So surprisingly, whenever you take away restrictions of, on traffic, it tends to rearrange itself to the better system somehow. Just a second. You want both. You want both. Okay. Meaning that. Because you can't have one without the other. Yeah? Um, cities now have to grow inwards, surprisingly. And um, I don't think that Munich is a very good example for that. But Amsterdam is, and Rotterdam is as well, um, for having a closer city. Yeah? The city centers are empty because they were grown up as what it's called a CBD, a central business district which is part, if anybody knows, is part of the crystallier theory of the uh, central place. It's a kind of a very analytical and very data-driven theory of uh, 
organizational deployment and development. And those cities, the problem of those cities is that they were designed from nine to five, and they get completely deserted from five to nine a.m. They are completely empty. Else. And because they are empty, just a second, because they are empty, emptiness is a kind of virus on a city analysis and on a city design. And it's a very dangerous virus because you never know, and people have tried time and time again, to understand which is the pattern of emptiness. But the thing is that it is a virus which acts all of a sudden without telling you anything and it can happen five years after being deployed. But you never know what, when it's going to happen exactly. And that, that happened especially in Rotterdam. Yeah, because from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m., the city center is completely empty. People flee from there. And that affected emptiness, again, is this kind of um, contact sickness that if a business sees that something is empty, they leave as well, as well. And if your neighbor business sees that you are leaving, they will leave. And it gets very contagious, very fast. Huh? It's like yeah. It starts, it's like this kind of snowball effect. It's very slow. You don't see it until it's way too late, somehow. No, don't think that, but that is my experience, sorry. Eh? <laughs> sorry for sounding that blunt. But what we have found is that these kind of uh, strategies in Barcelona act as uh, crystals. Yeah? In order to, for something, in order to do sugar, you have to put a small crystal of sugar. Yeah? Then you get the whole crystallized sugar. Yeah? You are not regulating, you are encouraging the things to happen. Yeah, you are not, this has nothing to do with government design in that regard. I'm answering your question? As well, that can be. Um, I don't recall which is the data policy of Berlin. I know that, for instance, Barcelona has a very open, open data set, <laughs> so to speak, and it's very broad. Um, you can actually measure um, tax. It's anonymized, but you know which space is paying taxes and which not, for instance. Uh, you know which is the water consumption, uh, which one is uh, connected to electricity the expenditure on street cleaning and so on. So, and that actually helps because you can easily monitor the hardware data and then compare and crunch it with the perception. Good okay. Be reversed. Be reversed. Yes, it can be reversed. Actually, um, uh, Cáceres, which I'm sure that you really don't know where it is. Uh, Cáceres is um, the place in Spain where the Jabugo ham is done. Mm -hmm. This kind of very, very expensive ham, um, which is very, it's, it's actually very close to Portugal. 
um, it takes actually a lot of data crunching and data business thinking. I mean, you really need to, to do that very precisely because what you need to do is actually um, think what is that village good at and enhance it. But thinking about a period of 18 years rather than a period of three years. No, 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 no. It's not a long-term chance of bringing back life. Is that in order to be successful, you need to think that you cannot plan it for three years, because then the fall will be even larger. So, yeah, you need to think that it's very helpful to think how somebody will live from zero to eighteen or from zero. How are you going to be? How are you going to design a life path from zero to twenty-five? in that regard. That is the, a way to actually constrain a perception chain for a large city. Because else, you will get this kind of spiky economic activity, which disappears three years later. And you cannot have that. So. OK. Uh, of what? For the, for the you said in one sentence where you compare to Amsterdam and Rotterdam with the yeah okay <clears throat> because Munich 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 doesn't have the incredible rate of empty spaces of a CBD oh. as Rotterdam. Okay, so, so so basically Munich never had it has a certain emptiness, but it's not at that rate. I mean, um, if you take, usually the primest place of a city is in front of the city hall. <laughs> no, it's true because it's where the power is, to be honest. That's it. There's no escape. Um, the funny thing of Rotterdam is that the three buildings which are right in front, they have to be uh, squatted, officially squatted, because nobody wanted to have an activity there. So you get the picture of how drastic that emptiness is. I mean, you can get a, how was it? How much was it? A 500 square meter office space for 150 euros per month. <laughs> but the reason for that is just to avoid that place being squatted. And that, that is a large problem of, of the city, obviously. OK. No, just to thank you for having me. And I hope that although being a bit abstract, uh, you know, it's not about programming, right? But I guess that you get the picture. We haven't talked about programming because we, what I wanted you to know was what goes before programming or data and what is the result of that, yeah? It's very important for you to picture what can be the result of doing data crunching and so on. And that, that data crunching and even the data has to be designed. Because if you don't design the output, I'm not saying that you have to um, squeeze the output in that sense. You don't have to uh, picture it and uh, put it better, right? But you have to actually design, because that will help the whole data process as well. Yeah? And that's it. Thank you for having me.